is set up the way that I usually set it up. So, okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to obviously hear me in the background, those of you on Zoom, people who are in the class, we're now down to four, which is awesome. Go team four. Um, okay, so now we're starting to get into the rhythm of how class is going to generally work where, you know, on the Thursday after you can take time and go over the lecture and the video and we'll sort of discuss anything in that that you maybe had any questions now if you're on zoom you're going to have to unmike if you have a question um, because i can't look at chat while we're talking so um so were there any questions about the history of the time and we understand why we call it the restoration what are we restoring Catholic Church, not the Catholic Church. Freedom. Now, one could say freedom, but there's more to it. Who is restored to the throne? Oh, I'm sorry, the monarchy. Yes, Charles II in the English throne. So one of the things that's really important is to understand that Charles II, after his dad was killed, was shipped all over the world. So he went to Scotland, he went to Germany, he eventually ended up in France. And that's why this is kind of important because he grew up in a lot of ways in France during the Commonwealth. He was very much influenced by the French style. And so the French Baroque is ever so slightly different, even though the Cavalier and a lot of those ideas are really from those French styles. As he was there, the styles started to change. And he took on a bit of the more flamboyant styles that were popular in France at the time, especially with Louis the 15th and his court. Sorry, Louis the 14th and his court. There are a lot of Louis, I know. There are Louis everywhere, there are Charles's everywhere. And now we're gonna get into George's. It's crazy. Need a little sip of water here. So when we use the term restoration we use that in a lot of ways because it helps center where we are in the big picture so let's take a look at the board so those of you at home you can see an image of the board and uh you will not see me at the board it's just a photograph but what i've done was i kept the cavalier drawings and now to the right of those are where we're gonna see the general silhouette change a little bit into that restoration silhouette. Now, what becomes interesting for my money is the Cavalier was really relaxed, right? It was incredibly soft. We're going to see a few details of that relaxation living amongst things. However, we're going to get much more triangular. And for men, that's gonna to lead to a kind of formality but for the women their triangularity leads to a very distinct um rigidity i guess you could say in the silhouette and what makes this really interesting is this is kind of it for menswear so up through the beginning of this we've been really focusing a lot on menswear and how it's changing and how they're fashionable but once we cross into our next period, into the Rococo, from here on out, basically, it's all women's wear all the time, okay? Because men will settle into an idea in this period, which for all intents and purposes, cements how men's wear is viewed, even though the details will change, even though silhouettes will change, even the, the textiles will change. Ultimately, we cement the idea of what clothes are for men. Does that make sense? Awesome. So if we see our cavalier gentleman here, we notice that, which is all the way on the left, we see a much rounded, much more, again, casual silhouette that feels soft, feels natural to the body. And what we're going to see in the restoration, and again, remember, we're still in that kind of weird time where we're figuring it out. I promise you, the next period is going to be perfect. But what we tend to see is the use of the hat all the way through the shoulder, all the way through the, the kamika or the chemise, 
all the way to the breeches, creating this triangular look, looking like a Christmas tree, right? Then those two little legs sticking out there. And one of the things that makes this so popular are the petticoat breeches, these very full breeches that look like skirts, right? So here on one of the dress forms, and for those of you at home, I guess you can come in. If you're in the building at some point, pop in and take a look. You can see a version of petticoat breeches. Now, these didn't just magically show up in 1660, right? They took a while to get there. We saw a few unbuckled or ungirdled breeches in that fighting scene. But what this does is it sort of gives volume at the bottom. And we're going to see lots of illustrations and art of these. But we notice that that is very different from where we came from. Remember all those Venetians, all those even slops. Now they're turning into these breeches. And they are bifurcated, meaning two legs, right? They are still bifurcated, but you notice when they're on the body, don't they look like a skirt, like a short skirt? Next, the jacket. So where we saw the doublet before, and if we look at you know the sort of cavalier image, imagine that we remove that peplum and we're left with a very short jacket. Because remember, those waistlines for men start to move up, and then the peplum comes from there. Well, imagine. Remember all those ties we saw, all the galads on to those? Imagine that we untied all of those, took that off, and we're left with this. And this jacket that we see here is called the bolero, just a short jacket. So if you notice, between the bolero and the petticoat breeches, we have a lot of shirt. And so that shirt is often bloused out to help create that silhouette. The other thing we'll notice, the sleeves were, you know, full length or three quarters. We're going to see them zip up to half, allowing us to see even more of the kamika or the shirt. Yeah. So is the piece under the um, bolero part right there connected to the piece that actually just grabs on the arm? Like yeah, so this is just a shirt. Yeah. So basically, just like my shirt, I'm blousing it out here, I'm blousing it out here. The sleeves will still see slashes and such, but notice that they're much more decorated, right? We have lots of gallants in there. Even the petticoat bridges, tons of gallants, the use of lace, the use of even more ribbons. And I mean, there's like, I think there's like 25 yards of ribbon in this <laughs> pair of petticoat breeches. Um, and we can see each of those feelings of ties, even if they're not necessarily tied on. We can see this is a little silly though. It is a high point. It's one of those demarcations in fashion history where you're like, you gotta talk about this. But it goes away very quickly. Yeah. It's funny because I look at the, the petticoat breeches and they kind of like remind me on combinations of the two. Yeah, yeah. We can certainly see that there are similarities to things we're gonna see down the line. And what's really interesting about this period in reference is this Baroque style all the way down. You'll never watch pirate movies again the same way because you will see a lot of pirate movies pulling from the Baroque all the way up. Even if we think about you know, Captain Hook, we're going to see a reference coming up in just a few minutes. Yeah. I don't remember why they picked Baroque to base it off of. Well, because that was a huge time of pirating, right? And most of those films take place in sort of the 18th century, the beginning of the 18th century when colonization is happening. And so the pirates are sort of wearing older styles, slightly older styles. If you're interested in pirating, I'm going to recommend a video by CGP Gray. If you don't know CGP Gray, excellent, excellent uh, person in um, the YouTube world. But he did two videos about being a pirate, what it's really like to be a pirate and what the positions are. And it's really interesting. But, but you see it, you know, there are some movies where it's more Victorian inspired. There's some movies where it's more 17th or sorry, uh, 16th century inspired. 
but most of our kind of theatrical sense, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean tends to sit in this late or the, the latter part of the 17th century into the beginning of the 18th century. But as you can see, this style is a difficult wear, right? <laughs> this isn't something that is easy to be taken very seriously in. And if we think about the pieces that we had previous to this, we are going to see a complete opposite style of jacket find its way in. So what would be the exact opposite style of jacket to the bolero? Is the bolero the short one? Yes, this is a bolero. Upper heavy clothes. No, I'm thinking of a trench coat. <laughs> okay, we're getting close. So a very long coat, right? Something that goes from shoulder to knee, maybe even ankle, starts to become, where's my little chocolate? There it is. That's my secret chocolate. Tends to become the garment of choice. This idea, and for those of you at home, you'll see this in slides, so don't worry about it. But eventually, covering up the entirety of the body from shoulder down. And you can see in its first stages, it is still very triangular, though they will experiment with it. Again, we want to say, you know, it was really high waisted for all of a hot second. And then when we do start shaping, we're going to shape it super low and then down. So you'll even see things where it feels like it's buttoned in that manner. So, you know, and we'll, we'll reinforce this when we get to slides, but to kind of get the movement of things, this is where we go. Underneath these, oh, and this jacket is in the terms list is called a justicor. And this is the term we're going to use. Sometimes it's spelled juice aco. And this is the term we're going to use for both this period and the ninth, uh, the sorry, the uh, 18th century, the Rococo, to describe those coats. Sometimes in books you'll see them reference this frock coats. That's something different in costume history. We want to be very, very careful of that. Now, underneath, we start the habit of wearing another garment in between our kamika, our shirt, and our justicor. And that garment is called a waistcoat. And that waistcoat is similar in idea as the thing I'm wearing today. What do we call this today? A vest. A vest, correct. For this class, anything that resembles this idea, we're going to call a waistcoat. Because when we think of a vest, we have very specific ideas. It matches perhaps a suit. It never has sleeves. It tends to end at the waist, right? These waistcoats that go underneath our dress decor could have sleeves. They're never to be seen necessarily. It could be sleeveless. They're longer. You know, there's lots of stuff going on. So I call them waistcoats because they cover our bodies and they add another layer of warmth to the whole thing. But as we can see, we're starting to build up the idea all the, you know, of what we think of menswear all the way up until, say, the 1950s, which is a shirt, a waistcoat a jacket, a trouser, right? The justicor being the jacket, the waistcoat being the vest or the waistcoat. Underneath, we see, you know, the breeches acting like the trouser. And it sort of sets us up for that world. We'll still see the triangularity in a lot of cases, but as the period moves along, we're going to see it start to flounder as they're figuring it out. So by the time we get to the 18th century, you're like, here we are, we got it, we're on it. Does that kind of make sense? Excellent. You could see that sort of in the illustrations for those of you at home. 
Women's wear still stays relatively soft through much of the restoration until just as we're starting to move out of the restoration, we kind of build on this high waisted, but get tighter and more triangular and more triangular and more triangular. So we're like in the 1670s, 1680s, we start to see this incredibly formal idea of a gown. Yeah. So would you say this girl was mostly for the upper class people and then uh, it would trickle down like as time went on, then lower class start wearing things that resemble, but they're a little bit behind the time. In many cases, yes. Mm -hmm. But also, and I'm going to show you a slide in here, because of the way that clothes are working, you can manipulate your clothes to have a style. Like even this gown that is here, this green gown that we know is very cavalier, I can sort of fashion this in the latest style, in a sense, just by doing this, right? Which is, for those of you at home, dragging that back. Now, this is the first time we're going to call a gown a very specific name. It still is gown, right? We could still call it a dress. But I like a very different word for this. And that word is mantua. And, you know, in casual costume history, mantua just means a very formal gown, a court gown in a lot of cases. I use it to describe this style, this very conical waist. The overskirt called the modeste or the overskirt is drawn back over the hips to the very, very, very back. Now, I'm using the word bustle as a verb, meaning we're bustling it back. We're going to use the noun version of that when we get to Victoriana. But this idea of moving it all back. And once we move that modest back, where is our focus? Well, certainly silhouette wise on the hips, but what part of what clothing piece is now going to be our focus? Right. The underskirt, we have two names potentially for that. One is the jupe or the secret. secret. So you can understand now the jupe is going to be really where our efforts are in a lot of ways. Now, for those of you who didn't take first semester, these underskirts, even in this Cavalier, often we would just have a single panel of really expensive fabric because that open gown would only show some of it, right? Well, once I lift these overskirts, these modest skirts, now we're going to have a full view of this. So we're going to have to think about the entirety of it. Does that make sense? It's no longer just a little decorative panel sewn onto crap fabric. Now it's, we've got to think of the whole thing. And what they tend to do is use a lot of, let's move her out of the way just a bit. Oh, they tend to use lines, visual lines within the garments to visualize the garment in a different way. So we tend to use lines from shoulder to basque to elongate and create a triangularity. But the skirt, we tend to see decorations that run across the skirt. And what does that do? It gives it a visual emphasis that makes it look wider. Does that make sense? Cool. But if you notice, for those of you at home in your right hand drawing, for those of you in class on this drawing, do you notice there's a triangularity added there as well? And part of that is not only the narrow shoulders, not only, as you were saying, the, the silhouette change on the hip, but also do you notice there is this jetty of lace jumping out of the top, and that's called the fontage. It's like what we might think of as a mantilla, the Spanish mantilla, but they're often in white lace. The other thing is they're not just like hot glued onto a headband. 
they're incorporated into a cap. Now, if you remember a lot of the illustrations that we saw previous to this, women kept their hair covered. When we got to the Cavalier, natural hair was often seen, though every once in a while you would see a cap. Now caps tend to be part of everyday life. A sheer linen cap, we sometimes call them mob caps, but our emphasis here really is on that montage, that height. But these are also, as you were sort of pointing out, the most fanciful, the most courtly. But it does speak, just as clothes trickle down to us, it does speak to the entirety of the population because they have the ability to manipulate their clothes, right? Unlike us who have to shop for those things that are fashionable, they're just looking at what they have and refashioning them. Yeah. This might be a, a dumb question. It's not a dumb question. So like, what's the, where do you draw the line of the difference between like, like a, a Polonese? Uh -huh. We're going to get to Polonese soon. Okay. Because for this class, we use that term specifically for the Rococo. Okay. And it has, it has very specific things. Now, again, and this is where we get into trouble because I try to order it for students to understand how to find the, the key factors where because costume history is not a science, but a social science, people use all different terms interchangeably. So you might see that term used for something like this, but mantua is a better term because it, it really speaks to the formality. Okay, so as we can see, it's going to slowly move through from really casual to high, then long and low, for women softer to much more rigid. And then what's going to happen after this? Oh, it's going to get loose again, and it's going to get tight, and it's going to get high, and then it's going to get low. It's going to bounce, you know, we're going to reject what we just saw is not being fashionable anymore. In every period that we hit, it's going to, especially for women, feel like a new story. Men are going to slow down. Women are going to take the presence of fashion. Okay. Here, I brought in a justicor. So you can see that it is just basically a big triangle, right, of textile, but still has the short sleeves, has the ribbons, the gallants on it and would cover up most of the body, sort of giving us a sense of where we are. Now, neckwear for men becomes very pop and important. We're gonna see two different types. The first one we see here starts developing later, which we call the cravat, which is taking a piece of cloth and wrapping it around the neck. One of the ways you always know it's restoration is there'll be a red bow that's sort of sewn into it, much like the red heel saying, take a look, take a look. Or this other style of collar, which you can see really comes from the falling band collar we saw in the Cavalier. It's just not starched. And imagine if we did this, it feels like that lace collar, but it's softly drawn more towards the front. I mean, that's also called a rabat collar but it's just, it feels more bib like and less sort of paper towel on the shoulders for a uh, pageant play in grade school for pilgrims. So that's for men. So that's just giving you a little bit of the visualization before we move into slides. Allegra, do you mind hitting the lights? I would if I could. Which one is the light? Over here. Okay, so now I'm going to share another screen. We're going to go, no, no, no. Why isn't this? Oh, I got to do it this way. For those of you at home, sorry. Bye. They never do. Uh, 
Okay. Rain is better than snow, though. Oh, no. Thursday's not looking very prefer, good right now. I would prefer to walk up the terrible roadside to back hill in the snow. <laughs> Okay. So now we're going to look at the art that sort of supports this. I think we have about 45 minutes. Excellent. Excellent. 45 minutes. Now, again, we're still dealing with this idea of Baroque. So architecture isn't going to change in the same way that clothing changes. And we're going to see this throughout history. We're going to have big ideas. But as we move into the Rococo, we're going to see the idea of uh, decorative arts changing more than architecture does. We're now going to go on a slow path. So when we talk about, you know, Baroque architecture, we're thinking about these grand buildings, and we're going to see the Guga get revisited and brought down. Now, again, it's still a lot. However, we're going to start to see it balanced down eventually by the time we get to the next period become much more subtle and much more interesting. But we can see buildings like this one much more in our world in a lot of ways. But the predominant building, oh no, I just wanted to show this. Here again is taking that Baroque and sort of re-envisioning it to something a little bit less tacky, right? But still imagine a person next to this you know, which is basically just about the same size as the, the round there, you know, it still has the weight and the heaviness of the Baroque as we saw it. But the place that is Baroqueest of the Baroque is Versailles. So this is a picture of Versailles when I went to visit it, uh, which was a magical day because when we left, you know, um, how foggy it was this morning where you could barely see in front of you. Well, we got on the train first thing in the morning we couldn't even, we get to the town where Versailles is, it's about 45 minutes outside of Paris. You get off the train and they literally had people with flashlights leading the crowd through because you're just walking down through this town. You can't even see the stores that are near you. And then you turn sort of to the left and you start up a hill. And just as we started up the hill, the fog started to lift ever so slightly. You could see the blue sky started to pull in and the sun hit Versailles as we were walking up the hill. I mean, it was magical, right? And because gold leaf and gold is part of this, all you saw were these sort of glowing gates and these glowing rooftops sort of jetting out at you. And throughout the course of the day, it just got even more beautiful. We'll talk about Versailles a million times. But here we see kind of the most baroque part of Versailles that was where Louis decided that he was gonna move his court and really turn it from just a crappy hunting lodge into a palace as we know it. Now, some of these elements are more um, even Rococo a little bit later in their styling, but things like the Hall of Mirrors really resonate that idea. And imagine this space First of all, mirrors on this scale were very minimal in the world. And it was during this period that they really figured out how to make mirrors. But imagine this space in its glory at night with candlelight everywhere. And all you're seeing is yourself for the first time in mirrors, right? If you had a mirror, it probably was very small. For those of you at home, I'm holding up my hand. You know, it may be a looking glass. Maybe you walk past a piece of glass where the sun hits it just right and reflects you. But imagine for the very first time, some people would have never seen themselves from top to bottom and were relying on everybody else to tell them how they looked. That must have been really exciting, right? And then imagine the glow. Now, this is when I was there um, and they had this incredible exhibit of this Japanese artist whose name escapes me right now. But if you look in the back, you can see there were these very hyper modern kind of anime sculptures throughout the whole building. But this is what it looks like when it's empty. Oh, wow. You know, and the scale is incredible. And if you want a taste of this, 
the a lot of the Newport mansions base their lives, base those houses, the Beaux Arts houses on Versailles. And if you go to Marble House, they have a small recreation in their ballroom of the Hall of Mirrors. Mm -hmm. But just imagine the glory and the grace of this. Must have been exciting and beautiful. David, I have a question. Of course. Um, are we supposed to be seeing what's on the screen right now? You should be. I don't know. The screen didn't share. I don't know if you meant to share it, but I can't see it. Okay, we'll give that Neither a try. Then. Okay. Let's try that again. Again, I, as I said, I'm working on a new computer, so sometimes it doesn't play right. It's working now. Great. So that's Versailles. Most of what we looked at was architecture, nothing you're going to be quizzed on. So don't worry about that. Thank you. One of my favorite things about Versailles is it's about stools. We'll talk about the stools, but, uh, but stools are really super important there because they're easy to move. And because everything was about court life, the king was constantly surrounded by courtiers. And I mentioned this in the lecture about this idea of des Aviers starts the minute that the king wakes up, the queen wakes up, in that their courtiers are all waiting there for them to wake up so that they can get dressed. And things like stools, incredibly important because everybody's just sitting there for hours waiting for the king or the queen to wake up. And even if you look at the bedrooms, which we'll look at when we get to Rococo, you'll see that the bedrooms have almost a theatrical presence to them, almost feeling like a stage. Um, so it's kind of crazy and whimsical and fun. So here we are, and that transition to Cavalier. And we can see some things that we sort of understand. So we see, you know, this Desavier style on her. It still feels somewhat formal, but it is very soft and pliable. If we look at the gentleman, we're starting to see things from the Cavalier melt away. And in this case, we're even looking at a kind of just a core. But notice how it's specially modeled after that cassock we saw. Mm -hmm. Still all those buttons, all those things to sort of show us wealth and such. So here's that timeline. And this really helps us with the men. Can you see how much the men really change in this period? Uh, I've got a, you're going to let me do it? You're going to let me move that? No, no. OK. It won't let me move it. I'm not saying move it. You can make it smaller. No, you can't because um, we're in screen share right now. So, or sorry, in uh, the presentation. So my mouse won't show up. No, no, so no, I, I know, I know what you're saying. It won't let me, it won't let me even minimize it really? in this. Yeah. Not even like to the one? Nope. Why? Because when we're in three different presentations at the same time, the mouse doesn't operate. Like I can recognize it. Mm -hmm. If I move my mouse, see how this, see how that comes up? However, it won't let me determine <laughs> its actual placement. So you have to do that beforehand, but I don't want to waste time. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So before we go into the painting and he had on the and then he had on it looked like underneath the wheel. Did he have a waistcoat underneath? Uh, we'll see, we'll see how that kind of plays out. In truth, no. He really just has his Kamika showing mm -hmm. and then the petticoat breeches underneath. I wasn't sure if that sleeve that shows um the black sleeve here looks like different from right there. Yeah. It's just like this one where it's folded up oh, into that cuff. So those cuffs it. that we saw yeah. are now up there. The but cuff. is that would that be the gauntlet cuff on that? Yeah, mm -hmm. but the thing is, it could be because if a waistcoat mm -hmm. had a sleeve on it, you could pull that waistcoat sleeve up. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine what the waistcoats with sleeves look like. We'll That's see. Why. We'll yeah. see. Okay. <laughs> I promise you. So really, when we're looking at it, with the exception of this dude here, which I'm still not happy with that date, but that's okay. Do you notice how it just starts getting? As we're working along the top, it starts just relaxing more and more. So by the time we're down here in the 60s and into the 70s, we're really looking at the most triangular of all. And you can see how 
the bolero sort of plays in there for a little while, and then we move into the just accord, and we sit with the just accord for the rest of it. It's just like any fat, right? It's like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. And then eventually somebody's like, is it? <laughs> you know? And so, you know, if we look here at 1665, we can see that bolero jacket showing off as much of the kamika or the shirt underneath as possible. But then eventually it sort of the weight changes and it's the fullness of the coat. But still, that's what I want you to remember is that triangularity. So this is where we're really focused on this guy, right? Louis. And even here, we can see to some degree his best asset. What do you think he thinks is at his best asset is? His legs. His legs, exactly. <laughs> and his hair, That's certainly. Hair. But, but he loved his legs. And so showing them off was really important. So imagine with the boots, with the, you know, the uh, breeches being as full, we can see why things like petticoat breeches and shoes would be much more popular. We can see the breeches in this case feeling kind of petticoaty, but they still feel like a pair of breeches where they're girdled together. Imagine if we just released that, it would feel like a skirt. But notice even here in this coronation outfit, the triangularity, right? We see very clearly from the top of the crown down through the hair, Notice that the ermine collar feels like a, a cavalier collar as well, right? So it feels fashionable in its styling, working all the way down to the shoes. And if you notice, those shoes have the red heel on them. Since there's nobody in the distance, I'm gonna limit down to a mask and a half. So, one of the challenges is in the restoration, we tend to see very staid visions of clothing. I'm just going to check this so that we have to go around the room for people. So there's a lot of black. So sometimes it is a little difficult to see the details in it. But what I love this illustration for, first of all, do you see how the doublet is now really more like a bolero, right? It's hard to see where it ends, but it's really putting the emphasis on the kamika and creating that triangularity. But I also love that the collar looks like it's inching its way forward. You see it? It looks like it's just gonna collapse down towards the front. Allegra. I'm trying to figure out why I feel like I can see the kamika in the middle of whatever's going over it, but I can't see it in the bolero now. Yeah. It could be a bolero. It's buttoned at the top and then again at the bottom, or is it buttoned and then? It's buttoned to this point, then uh -huh. spreads open. And then he has what appears to be like a cassock or some sort of cloak wrapped around his waist. Mm. Then we can see the sleeves. Notice how they're getting higher visually. There's a lot more white in there. Even with these huge cuffs, it still gives the feeling of like a half sleeve. Yeah. Would that black collar be part of the bolero? This here? No, it's, it's they'd always be separate. The point on this. So this is that cloak. Oh. If you look carefully, you can see that, that that's the collar of the cloak. And it wraps around. And then this part looks as though it's sort of being brought under. Got it. Yeah. So it's really like looking at the details of it and seeing what's in there. But really, the big picture for this is that silhouette. This is an excellent close-up of that robot as it moves completely forward. It looks just like a lace collar like we've seen before, those falling bands, but now it's really emphasized in the front. And we can see how even this will sort of hold out for a little while, but we will eventually just completely replace it with the cravat because it will have the same idea, the white at the neck, without needing to be fancy. If we look down the side of the sleeve, you can see those shorter sleeves with the cuff, right? The buttons all the way around that. And notice the triangularity in the front of this garment, whatever it is, we don't even need to worry about that because it feels like it's buttoned at the top, but then opened up, right? 
and we see again that triangularity. This is a real uh, bolero and breeches set. Now the trousers are much like, or the breeches are very much like what Louis was wearing in that painting, right? They still feel kind of like slops, but kind of short, short slops, right? But you can see how you could easily ungirdle those, but they do give a sense of kind of one element of a garment, like a petticoat or like a skirt. In this case, more like a bubble skirt, maybe. But notice all the gallants. Like if I can hot glue another ribbon on it, it's not enough. You know, like I can keep doing it and doing it. Now the jacket in this case, the bolero, really feels like it, it, it is just missing. It's, it's uh, peplum, right? Or it's uh, pector, uh, pectoral, sorry, peccadils. But if you look really carefully at the waistline, can you see all the small dots? you can actually see where those could be laced on. So imagine how easy that would be a style to change. You just remove your peplum and voila, you're in just in uh, the land of boleros. And we can see that the sleeves are sort of short. And we're going to play around with them throughout this period. But, you know, in this case, in most cases, more shirt is better. Here's another version of it, and this one really feels like a little bit of cavalier, a little bit of restoration, right? The sleeves feel very cavalier -y, right, in their fullness and the pains, but notice the waistline kind of ends. And then these, we can see, are real petticoat breeches. And that's what's really fun about looking at real clothes, because they give you lots of different options of how these transitions might happen. And if the, you didn't have the most fashionable clothes, you wouldn't just take what you had and throw them away and get new clothes. You would then remove the sleeves, redo the sleeves, redo all the pieces that you could to now meet with the fashion. And here we go. There's no doubt that's a bolero, right? And can you see how the bolero moves to the kamika in its fullness and its blousing around the waist? And then notice how the petticoat breeches that we see here feel almost low slung, elongating the body, and then overall creating from wig to shoulder to kamika to the hem of the petticoat breeches, that perfect triangle. And as I had mentioned, this is where that kamika, that shirt really is important. You can't have turkey dressing all over the front of it, right? You want it to be perfect and white and beautiful. And so we can see how much more of the kamika would be showing and how important that would be to, to look solid in it, especially if you think of these darker colors, it would make it pop even more, right? If we think of those blacks, or in this case, even the burgundies and such. Here we can see a beautiful illustration. I love this one because we can see how even with all these pieces together, there's still such a strong triangularity in it. I keep using that over and over again because it really helps reinforce that. And even in it, you can see smaller triangles all over, right? The sleeve triangle, this cutout for the, uh, in the bolero, a triangle, the breeches, a triangle, the hair, a triangle, even the robot collar, in this case, just in linen, looks like a triangle, right? So remember triangles, if you don't already. Excellent example. Now, again, we would look at this probably before this class and think, oh, this is a pilgrim, right? Black, top hat, steeple, that little, you know, funny, I don't know, paper towel collar on. But when we look at this, what I want you to really see now is highest of fashion, right? Because we see that very short bolero jacket. Then we see a ton of the shirt. Then we see a ton of the petticoat breeches. And again, remember, this is just like a 10-year period that this kind of comes in and goes out. 
but it is so unique and so different from anything we ever see. We spend a lot of time, but it's really this steeple hat that adds the pau fe contemol of it, right? It makes it even more triangular, leading down to the um, the petticoat breeches. And then notice with this black, you have these white hose on. What are those showing off? Where does our focus go? Sure, our legs. And again, we connect that with that idea of Louis, you know, really making legs an emphasis point. Yeah. Could you just really quick remind me with what ten years this is? This is uh, like 1660, 1675, sort of in that 15-year period where we see it sort of rise and then drop away. Sorry, I just no, that's okay. So this is when kind of the boots were only for outside if you were doing some of shoes were kind of the focus. Yeah, shoes become the focus because shoes mean refinement. If even if we look at them, look how like fabulous they're starting to become oh right with these beautiful shaped toes and these heels you know we're going to emphasize that because boots are crude boots are boots are for activity which was fine in the cavalier you know the athleisure period but not anymore and so here we can see all these elements playing out whether it's the gallant whether it's the shorter sleeves the bolero jacket the petticoat breeches Notice even in this case, we see still kind of boot hose. Yeah, is that what that is? Yeah. Magic underneath there? But then they're just sort of flopped down. So you get like another fabulous tier, <laughs> right? It's all going to go away. This? Yeah. Those are gallants. So those are oh, ribbons, okay. but they're all on the side. Oh, okay. All right. There's so much hair. <laughs> but just as quickly oh, as that sort of is happening, also the idea of the justicor is really finding its way. Now, if you notice this one, can you see this feels like the the bolero in idea, but just super long? Right? We don't see a waistcoat. We're actually seeing more of the Kamika happening here. We're seeing the petticoat breeches. It's just that the coat goes from super high to super low. And we can see that these are living together yeah. like cats and dogs. It's all okay. Are those two pieces there with the red is on the print that's underneath it? Or is that one? Nope, this is all one. Because remember, oh, buttons yeah. and buttonholes are you know fashion uh status yeah. right so all of that is band work and buttons yeah. now if you notice this feels very much like a military uniform right and this is where military sort of keeps that idea of buttons and buttonholes as a decorative device because it's decorative without feeling flamboyant in a lot of ways right now notice, what is he wearing around his neck? Is he wearing that rabat collar? Yeah. No, he yeah. switched over to the cravat with then the red lace bow tied into that. I think he really wants us to look at that red. No. Exactly. <laughs> and then we can still see the gallants and we can see other stuff that we know. We see a walking stick. Notice that he has a sword behind him. So we're gonna see all these details still hang around just worn and used in different ways he tends to like the broader hat which becomes popular again as opposed to that steeple hat and but notice the proportions still are a little goofy like the sleeves now they were super short now they're going to be super long notice that remember before they were super full now they're super tight and this has happened like all of a sudden styles like this well, because that was very popular in France, along with those boleros. Oh, okay. But because Charles brought fashion with him, mm. he was much more concerned with how those things looked. And eventually, just like everything, people go, oh, no, this is a better look than this little short jacket. Mm -hmm. Like, this was cute, but let's put that away. <laughs> and, and its longevity really proves to us because we see basically this idea for the next 200 years.
We see some changes in it, but really we don't bother. Our eye sort of says, yes, this is where we're gonna sit and we're gonna sit here pretty much forever. Here's another version. Now notice how much more triangular this one is. And we can certainly see how full that will become. Now notice the full bottom wig at the top, right? Which is very tight and kind of high up, bouffanty, but then sort of hits the shoulders. Notice that the justicore is open in this case, allowing us to see, in this case, we can see the edge of it with the buttons. Notice that we're seeing all the waistcoat underneath. So much so that we don't even see the petticoat breeches anymore. And once we don't see the petticoat breeches anymore, we're like, well, let's just wear regular breeches under this. But we won't see them for a really long time. We're just sort of assuming because the silhouette's the same, right? But also talking about that idea of déshabillé, doesn't this kind of feel like a bathrobe or a robe over something more formal? And we're, we're going to see how that plays out as we're going along. And that's part of it, too. That's part of how these things change, because this is habillé, these robes feel more popular. Here we see where the switch starts happening. So remember, everything was kind of at the neck and then opened, right? Even in that last just accord. Now notice that the top is opened, but it's buttoned right down super low. And then for a little whimsy, we've even had a little sash around the waist. So again, it was like, it was high, and then it was low, and then it was high again, and then it was low. Then here we see that wig. Notice the cravat with the bow in it. Again, telling us it's restoration. We can see the justicore, and we can see the waistcoat. Then we can see the legs. Again, notice emphasis is really on a well-turned leg. Yeah. How do you tell the difference? How can you tell there's a bow there? Because if you look, you can see right there, it's not in red. It's a big bow. It is a big bow, How sure. Be a smaller bow? Oh, they're playing around with all sorts of bows. Okay, cool. Look at this one. Here we see that cravat tied around a really narrow red bow, right? Now, do you notice that the, you know, in some cases we're gonna see them made out of linen and in some cases we're gonna see lace. And when we get to our next period, because we see a lot less terms for men, we're gonna get a different term for that. But this idea of, of, you know, tying something around our neck is basically what I'm wearing around my neck right now, right? In fact, French still, this is called the cravat, right? A tie is a cravat, but it sort of stays in place. Notice how super low this opening is of the just decor, right? Showing off everything that's underneath. Yeah. Did tying something around your neck as a male back then for any sort of use or just for decoration? So it's this idea of keeping white around your face okay. in a lot of ways, right? Because um, and we're going to see it as a continuation through all these periods until cravats actually turn into other pieces of decorative soap, because white means that you haven't spilled food all over it, that you care about how you look. It's kind of the same way that we might think about, you know, uh, the Roman sort of toga all in white, you know. What's really swell with him is right next to it, we can see a woman in a mantua, right? It's very formal. Notice how we're sort of playing around with all the positioning, but it is much more triangular. I'm gonna skip through so we can get to women because we only have about 15 minutes left. But here we can even see that styling is really unique. And we'll see lots of variations in it. Here, Allegra, you can see that that bow, a little bit smaller in this case, but look at that wig. And then that little tiny mustache. So here we can see a banyan. I mentioned robes in the thing. This idea of a banyan, that is definitely not a, a just decor, right? It has no formality to it. But you can see how a banyan with a waistcoat sort of ends up feeling like Oh, 
I'm casual versus just the different sort of outfit, just the core that changes the whole feeling. But he wouldn't wear that outfit. Out. No, generally not. Generally not. It's casual unless he was really fancy, and then maybe he would. And remember him? Yeah. Now do you see even more kind of restoration? We're going to see him one more time too. So when we look at women in the period, all we're really focusing on in truth, my friends, is how we go from that more um, cavalier style through the, um, the de Zabier period into a much more formal, rigid mantua. Okay, and we're going to clip through these kind of quick. So first of all, stay incredibly important for our shaping. And here we see a that transition out of the Cavalier, which was very square, right? Even high waisted. Can you see how we're going to go back to that Basque front bodice? We love a good Basque front bodice. And when in doubt, that's what we always go back to. And then we try something and then we're like, yeah, Basque front really works well. Those but notice how this feels like it could just jump off her body at any moment. It feels like Desabier. Yeah, the sleeves, it just feels casual when it's really formal. We can see it getting much more stiff, much more rigid. And notice in this case, we're really getting into more of that overskirt, underskirt, modest cicle. Instead of focusing on the satin itself, the decoration is starting to take more prominence. Here we can see a great version. This is a, an artist whose name is escaping me right at the second Italian artist. But notice that there's a lot of classical influence, a lot of déshabillé in there. But we see proportionally and sort of silhouette wise, it feels of the time. Here we can see some women, nothing too spectacular, but notice the necklines having two very different stories, but it does feel very revealing in a way that we haven't seen clothes before, even here. But notice now the trunk or the, the bodice is really uh, conical, but it's not conical like Elizabethan, right? Remember Elizabeth, oh, go away. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, that felt very stuffy, where this just feels like the bodice is controlled, the body is controlled, the rest of it is sort of soft and flowy. And here we can see again how it hits those bones of the shoulder, showing off as much decolletage as possible. Notice the deep front, but notice also how the skirt, the modest, the overskirt has been bustled back, showing us a great deal more of the skirt underneath, the jupe or the secret. Now it's not quite as much as we will see, but you can see how it's, it's playing on that triangularity, right? It's playing on the movement down the body. She's wearing a cape. Uh, yes. There's a little bit of a sort of cape over there on the side. I'm looking at the back, like where you're standing, roughly. No, yes. Yes, yes, because she's a queen, so she has the oh, cape okay. on. So you can see it over one shoulder here, and then it's sort of trailing out, allowing us to see the ermine. And if we look at this, we can see it in the most casual way. Now, when we look at this, this feels kind of like milkmaids or something, right? And we're going to see this odd fascination with country life and daily life and court life all converging. And if you know where we're going when we talk about the Rococo, we're going to see how that plays. But notice, it is, it's really the bodice that tells us that this is actually a very structured garment, right? Because this part feels soft. It feels like I'm removing this or moving this because I need to be active. And if we look, we can see sort of the simplicity of some of the garments to sort of breach that land in the center of, are these milkmaids, are these lower class, or are these really wealthy women? And what's going to probably inform us are the hairstyles more so. And notice in the cap here, we're starting to get fontage land. 
these tiers of lace jetting up through the top of the head. And notice when the skirt, the modeste is pulled back, all of our focus is on the jupe, right? We're really focused there. That's a good question. Did they, did they have pre-sewn like back or would they have gotten the little side? They would they would often sew them in place because in a lot of cases these would be used in different ways, you know. Um, so you can see here, look at that skirt, and you notice that the lines of the bodice are very long, creating the triangle, elongating the torso. Even notice that there's a stomacher in there, a little center section. But then notice the skirt, almost like a Victorian skirt in some ways. The emphasis is across. Right, so that's giving it more dynamic triangularity through there. It's not even an underskirt anymore. Well, it is because it would go on first, but but it really is the skirt. Everything else is just trailing behind. You can see it sort of here, even in this case. You know, it's just tied with galants, but we can do all sorts of stuff. Here we see a great fontage, right? Just it looks like. It's just like tufts and tufts of lace on top of the head. So here we see a real one, a real mantua. And we can see, just as you're saying, because the jupe is of the same textile, it's almost impossible to see if this is really a gown or if it's something else. But if you look carefully, you can see if you follow down past the stomacher, see how it's then brought up. It's not as soft as those milk maybe style. But we get a sense of it rounding towards the back, knowing that the emphasis now is bustled with the, with the verb bustle, move towards the back. Here we see another great one. Now, in this case, notice that the, the jupe, the underskirt, is decorative in that it has lots of ruffling and it sort of emphasizes across, but it is still made of the same textile. We can see clearly the stomacher in there. We can see the fontage, but we can see how it's going to slowly move towards the 18th century, as we understand. And here we can see how much of that is, is bustled back. And can you see the waterfalliness of it into that train, that sort of thing that we drag behind us? And again, it could be buttoned, it could be sewn, all sorts of permutations. But again, if you're spending this much money on a gown, you're probably not committing to anything because it could change at any moment. And it certainly will by the time we get to the 1700s. Now, this is one of my favorites. This is from the Metropolitan Museum. And notice how rigid that is, how conical the bodice is, and how that skirt isn't even softly draped, but it's almost folded back. And then notice the jupe, they're using the stripes to give each of these areas its alignment. So if you look at the body, do you see how the stripes go down the body? If you look at the sleeves, it's going around the sleeves. And if you look at the jupe, it's going around. And then we can see how these are carefully folded towards the back. And it's even emphasizing the edge, because we're going to see what this is in a second. But Notice how that edge almost feels like a single sash wrapped around the waist, magically floating there. But what makes this really exceptional for my money is what you're looking at is a striped fabric that has been embroidered. So all that gold is hand embroidery. And those thicker panels act as almost as those sashes and those emphasis points throughout the garment. I mean, it's really spectacular. It almost looks like puff paint. It's so beautifully done. Um, but you could see how this could emphasize it. Yeah, like. So was it more common back then for the group to be like the same material? No, it, sometimes it's the same, sometimes it's different. It was, it's just the it ones, different? the ones that we have that exist because those jupes would probably be continued to be used. These are so specific and so formal that they were probably only used for this purpose. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. But you can see that they have a different story happening, no matter what. Those cicle, those jupe sort of have their own story. Now, here's where it gets kind of interesting. 
Here is an illustration of the same exact item. But do you notice how it's mounted differently? So there could have been a way that one could wear this, but it's definitely how it's perceived in the time. So this is the, the uh, Victorian mounting of it, the late um, 19th into the early 20th century. And do you notice how it's made to feel much softer? It looks Victorian. Even notice the drape feels just so much softer. And so it's really important how we look at these clothes in how they relate to the body. Same garment, different mounting. So here we're going to see some illustrations with very different shoe, right? Can you see how this one is like emphasizing lace and using bands and bands of lace around? This is really swell too, because we can see how all that fabric is just sort of wadded back and then the fontage sticking straight up. And this is also where we get into the idea of arms with or arms with chairs. Chairs with arms are reserved for men. Chairs without arms tend to be for women because chairs with arms get messy. But notice that it's like all the way up. And if you notice down the front, I mentioned this and we're going to see it again. This idea of ribbons all a shell, a series of ribbons running down the front that sort of ladder will become very popular for that fronting because it looks déshabillé. It looks like I could just go, shh, 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 the whole gown would fall off, right? And is that how it was constructed for those? No. Often, I mean, you could do it, but we're going to see when we get to the Rococo, probably how they would be done. Even more so looking like milkmaids, right? Mm -hmm. So much so that they even have aprons. But when you look at like the ribbons on the shell, you see the love uh, dot there on the face. Right, the beauty mark. Look at the fontage. This is just silly. No, no maid, no milkmaid would actually worry about this. But we can see a reference to the country life in amongst it. Here we see a pelerine. I mentioned this idea of capes become very popular. So you can see that lace cape. And then if you look down at her feet, you can see the shoes that we call mules. Right, a shoe without a back. Why would mules be important? Because when you start to wear all these layers of clothes, you want a shoe that you can just slip into, right? Otherwise, you have to put them on before you even start getting dressed. And then here, remember that gentleman who is the poor gentleman who sort of looked fashionable that we've seen a couple times? This is perhaps his wife. And so you can see that she has sort of manifested a similar idea of taking her overskirt and draping it back, showing the underskirt. But really in the big picture of it, she's even added like a capelet over it to sort of give the feeling of the off the shoulder. But we can see that the bodice is slightly different. So we can, you know, the poor or the lower classes can manipulate the clothes to reach those. Okay. I think I have one more, one more. Oh yeah, here's a shoe just to get a sense of it. Now it is a full back shoe, but we're gonna to start to see shoe culture become very popular as well. <laughs> and this is where we'll end up in the beginning of the Rococo, okay? So, um, so with that said, do we have any questions? Concerns? Okay, so the big thing, again, this is such a blip on the costume history bandwagon, but it is so unique and it really does help us get to the place that we're going to get. Okay, let's look quick. So we did see everything, yes, those of you at home. Any questions? Yes. Excellent. Any questions from the home gallery? All set. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, so, um, Rococo, yes, Rococo should be up by, I think it may be up already, but uh, definitely by the end of the day. And if you need any reinforcements, I'll turn this into a video soon. Okay. Uh, 
David, for yep. um, is Thursday's class just doing the exact same thing as this class? So we only have to worry yep. about it. So um, every, you guys are doing the lecture, or sorry, the slideshow presentation on Tuesday. Thursday's group, group one, will be doing exactly the same class that we just did. Gotcha. Okay, sorry. Okay. So I don't want costume design, so I got confused. Sorry. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Everybody have a great day. Thank you so much, David. Have a nice Thank day. You. Thank you, David. Talk soon.